I had a dream a few years ago in which I based my book, The Coming of the Cosmic Christ, in which um, this very clear voice said to me, your mother is dying. And in thinking about the dream, I realized how poignant and true that is, that Mother Earth is dying. Uh, the the uh, ozone layer is dying. So the protective, that maternal shield that protects us, the placenta even, uh, is dying. The forests are dying, which is, among other things, the lungs that process the air for us. And the animals are dying. And in many ways, the young people are dying out of despair and um, unemployment and educational systems and religious systems that are not reaching the heart and are not really reaching the needs of our young people. And so I think that this whole theme of the mother principle dying, including Mother Church. I mean, I have read statistics that say that 3% of Scandinavian Christians practice religion. I know in France, 4% of Catholics practice. In Germany, 7% of Catholics. So there's something about Mother Church, 90, was it 4% of French Catholics practice. That means 96% are looking for other forms. It doesn't mean they're not spiritual people, but the forms we have are not working. And so if, if the church is going to stick with these forms until, until it dies totally, then Mother Church is dying. What do you think has happened? Why is it like this with the church? What's your explanation? Well, we're, we're living through a time when I think the entire human species is being awakened to different forms of living and survival issues such as the ecological crisis. And um, religion always has to let go of forms and respond to the cultural needs. For example, in the 13th century, there was a great cultural shift, and that's when Francis of Assisi invented a new kind of religious order, and Dominic did too. And we built the cathedrals. They were a new thing. We built universities. So the question today is, obviously, we need new forms of uh, spirituality and religion today and education, but do we have the energy and the vision for it? That's the issue. Or are we just going to kind of um, fall asleep and come some kind of patriarchal death wish. You've said that uh, religion is too important to be left to bishops and priests, that is a question between man and God, the relation between man and God, and you call us all mystics. How, how is that? Well, I think every human being is born a mystic, because a mystic is simply someone who experiences awe, the wonder of being here, the amazement of being here. And we all did this as children. Um, and it comes back in a setting like this, where uh, we're close to nature. We realize we're here to play in the universe, like wisdom does in the book of Proverbs in the Hebrew Bible. And like Jesus did, who was called wisdom from the start, Sophia, Lady Wisdom. So um, the problem is that we get this sense of play and cosmology, being in the universe. We get it beaten down through education and work and um, problem solving and uh, unfortunately religion is often part of the problem too. So we have to recover the mystic and um, that's about recovering that divine child in all of us that wants to play in the universe and then take that energy of play and passion 
to work for compassion and justice because that's the other side to mysticism. What about yourself? Were you a mystic <clears throat> when you were a child? Well, certainly, certainly. Yeah. Playing in the fields of Wisconsin. <laughs> <laughs> Did and you then, experience uh, God as a child? Of course. I think everyone does. You know, the experience of wonder mm -hmm. and the experience of mystery yeah. and the experience of the night sky. And um, you see, urban society and, and really our Newtonian worldview has taken this away from us because we've been taught that we live in a machine. Well, a machine is pretty boring. Once you learn it, you learn it. <clears throat> There's nothing new to explore. But the universe is not that way. With the new creation story from science, we are rediscovering the mystery of the universe. And this is why so many scientists today are moving from atheism to mysticism because they are being touched by the mysticism that the deeper mysteries of the fact that we live in a universe of one trillion galaxies, 200 billion stars in our galaxy alone, and um, 15 billion years that, through which decisions were made that brought our species here and made this planet right for other species as well. It's simply amazing. It's simply awe-inspiring. So we have a new creation story. It's so important. And it's coming from science, not from any ethnic or religious group. So it, it trans... Um, sends the globe. Yeah, but what, how does it affect religion, traditional religion? Well, you see, that's the point. A healthy religion would get excited, terribly excited, about the new cosmology and the new mysticism that's flowing out of it and would make connections with our mystical tradition um, and with Jesus, who was a mystic, very much a mystic, experienced God in, na in nature, in the desert, in the Garden of Gethsemane, uh, with his friends, um, his parables bring in everything from seeds to bushes to trees to birds, and goats and sheep. We forget how non-urban Jesus was because most of our theologians are, are urban people in the last few Is centuries. Is that the problem you think, that they are urban people? Well, that's part of it. And part of it is that we've been on this quest for the historical Jesus and we've ignored the cosmic Christ tradition, which is our mystical tradition. We need a balance of both. Jesus is a liberator, yes, but also the Christ who is in the rainforest, who is in the uh, waters, who is in the soil, who is in the food, and who is in the, the faces of every individual. As Jesus said, you do it to one of these least of my brethren, you do it to me. So if we're doing this, if we're destroying the soil and the food chain and the ozone, and the forest, you bet we're doing it to the Christ. You even said that uh, Christ, the cosmic Christ, is a euphemism for the goddess. What do you mean by that? <clears throat> yes, of course, the awakening of women's experience in the feminist movement is a terribly important gift to the churches. Now, some of them are saying, ah, <laughs> eek. But of course it's a gift. It always is. The last time there was an authentic renaissance in the West, in Europe, was the 12th century. And it was a grassroots renaissance like we need today of women, freed slurf, serfs, and young people. That's exactly what we need today. And <clears throat> the goddess came in, and as a goddess, this, the Mary energy in the church that gave birth to Chart Cathedral and 500 cathedrals the same size, all dedicated to Mary, the goddess in Christianity. So the return of the goddess is good news for everybody because it's about the return of creativity the honoring of creativity as the divine power in every one of us. And actually this fits the new creation story beautifully because one of Einstein's big shifts from Newton was <clears throat> Newton really taught that the universe, like a machine, was for the most part produced um, and determined. Whereas Einstein and the post-Einsteinians are saying, no, the universe is constantly birthing. It's been birthing from the first second of the fireball. Meister Eckhart, the great 14th century Dominican mystic, said that, uh, he said, what does God do all day long? God lies on a maternity bed giving birth. So these images of God as mother and divinity as feminine uh, are terribly important to balance our psyches because Western culture is obviously far too patriarchal and it's, um, it's wounding our souls, both men and women alike. But do you think the, the goddess is Threatening the church? Is that why it's threatening? turning back? Threatening, yes. Well, I think the goddess is challenging the church. Now, I think there's a very fine line between being challenged and being threatened. And if your ego is weak, if your heart is weak, you haven't been doing your spiritual work, then indeed one sees the goddess and women energy in general as a threat. Um, 
I think there's a, that comes down to a crisis of faith. Because what faith means is trust. It's not about dogmas, primarily. it's about trust. That's the New Testament word for faith, to trust. Where in all patriarchal church structure is being threatened by the goddess or by women or by native people or by the young, that says something about a spiritual uh, weakness, a spiritual um, disease really, that people's hearts are not strong enough to take in all the possibilities in which divinity plays and expresses herself over the centuries. And in a special way today, divinity is being expressed through um, women. Again, the whole Bible, biblical teaching is that God speaks through the Anuim, right? The Anuim, the poor, those without a voice. Well, women are obviously one big segment of society that have had their, their voices, their throats really, the throat chakra closed uh, over the last few centuries with industrialism and with uh, patriarchy and with uh, the urbanizing of life. And so women getting their voice back is, I think, uh, good news for everybody. But it's challenging. about a mystical journey that we have to do, each one of us. And you start that with a via positiva, to say that we have to recover the, the uh, creative power of God. How do we do that? Well, the experience of delight and wonder, awe, amazement at our existence, uh, this can be recovered. Um, the new creation story helps us to do this. The, um, the story that we all began in the original fireball and that over the billions of years, decisions were made on our behalf, unconditional love, really, that brought us forth, such as the expansion, the rate of expansion of the fireball, if it had been one millionth of a millionth of a second, slower or faster than it was over 750,000 years, we would not be here, the earth would not have happened. Many stories like this. Um, again, a creation story is the way all tribal people, including the Jewish people, got their young people excited about being here. And for centuries, really, the West has not had a creation story. And this is one reason we are addicted to television, alcohol, and drugs, and shopping and all, is that our souls are much bigger than the world in which we're living. And uh, so we can recover uh, joy, the joy and delight of living in the universe, God's temple. And that is the first, the first path. It's not unlike Genesis is saying, let there be light. You see, light is the first creation. But how do I know if I have experienced the positive? How do I know it? Gratitude, thankfulness. I don't know if you have this word in Swedish, but in English, thankful, grateful. Yeah. Gratitude is something that wells up in you. It fills you up. Uh, it's bigger than us. It overwhelms us. You are really praising creation, aren't you? Praise I'm, is I'm, key. Yeah. I know that you even say that uh, love making is a prayer, you say? Of course. Yeah? Well, why? <laughs> well, we have a book about it in the Bible, but no one pays much attention. The, book, the Song of Solomon, you see, the Song of Songs, uh, praises um, the love between human beings as being a cosmological theophany. It's, an, it's a revelation of the divine. You see, we are all an expression of the divine. And so people who love each other are encountering the divine in their love. And, um, Could we even talking about sexual mysticism as a, as a way to global renaissance? To Definitely, because uh, it seems to me without opening up the sexual chakra, which is the second of our chakras, the other ones don't get open. And so Eros and the rediscovery of passion, passion for living at all levels, um, including lovemaking, is, uh, is absolutely necessary for renaissance to happen. It's a little bit surprising for me. I mean, what about the celibate? Well, you know, Audre Lorde, a uh, black poetess in America, says, she says, I am erotic 
when I write a poem, when I bake bread, when I make a table, or when I make love. And you see, so eroticism is the passion we bring to living. And that includes all expressions of love and, uh, and self-expression of what we believe in. So I could be a sexual mystic even if I'm living in celibate, you mean? Well, you'd have to be. Otherwise, you'd just dry up like a prune. other in the most crone way. What do you say? Do you see any way out of it? Well, you see, the second path in the creation journey is the via negativa, the darkness, going into the pain and the darkness. And there are many wars in the world today. Bosnia is a horrible example, but the war against the soil. We're losing 25 billion tons of soil a year. Um, the war against the ozone layer. These are wars against our children because they will not be able to uh, eat well, not be able to go out in the sun. So there are so many wars inside the human heart. And uh, the mystics teach us to go into the dark night of the soul, not to run from the bad news, not to cover it up with, with uh, just happy news or happy talk or addictions, but to go into the darkness and the despair and to be there. And, um, uh, you know, and of course, something like Bosnia, we have to look at the history and how did this come to pass? And how many ethnic groups are there? How, for how many generations will we carry the hatred, uh, you know, into the next generation? But this is about forgiveness, therefore. Mm -hmm. People have to, same with the Palestinians and the Jews. We have to forgive, not out of altruism, but out of letting go. The same is true between native indigenous people and, and uh, colonizing people, or between men and women. Um, we need some giant rituals around the world today, grief rituals, where we deal with a broken heart and we deal with the centuries, sometimes centuries of, uh, of hostility and violence between people. So this whole issue of heart work is, I think, behind most of these issues of ethnic um, and racial uh, recrimination. So it's an inner transformation you're asking for. Is it's that a so? big part of it. It must be inner and outer. There must be the social structures too. But I mean, I've been told by Croatians recently, you know, who have suffered so much in that war in Bosnia, that they get along fine with their Serbian neighbors and their Muslim neighbors. It's the politicians who are manipulating centuries of resentment in the hearts of people who are really carrying on this war. And when you think about it, it was resentment that got Hitler elected. And so we have to deal both with the hearts of humans, such as resentment, but also with the social structures of injustice that allow this kind of um, genocide to take place. I might say the creation also told me it's too late to help, that the Europeans should have intervened three years ago when they could have. Does it feel, uh, fill you with despair, the situation in Bosnia today? Does it contradict well, your vision? No, because the human race by itself would fill anyone with despair. A whole history is like this. I mean, look at 20th century history. It's all wars, isn't it? Look at the First World War and the Second World War, the Vietnam War. Um, if we isolate the human from the spirit, from the capacity of the rest of nature to recharge us and to um, liberate us, and from the message of people like Jesus, you know, that we can be liberated, and that he brings liberation, as do other religious leaders. If we were to cut ourselves off from that good news, then I would be stuck in despair. But despair itself can be a good place to be for a while. I think despair is real. I think there's a lot of despair around the world today. I think the young are in despair everywhere, and they're telling us something. So despair is a place for learning. 
that's what you say in Via Negativa, that yes. despair it's is part of the journey. That's right. Eh? It's part of the Via Negativa. It's a place for learning. Like and wrath and everything. Yes, definitely. Yes, anger too. And anger is part of grief. Mm. You have to deal with it and go deeper into the sorrow. But and you get emptied. But from where do we get the trust to letting go? To let go and to well, go into nothingness? The trust comes from first from the Via Positiva, you see, from our place in the universe. There's great trust because we have been loved from before the beginning, as the Julian Norris, the 15th century mystic, said. And um, this universe has basically been a very benign place for our species. And we have been entrusted. Not only do we trust, we have been entrusted with uh, the blessing, the original blessing that creation is. And the problem is that we have violated our trust so often. And of course, that's what sin is. But when you enter into the Via Negativa deeply enough, then you move into creativity. That's the next stage, the Via Creativa. Oh yeah, now we're there. And um, there we connect to the the creator spirit and the creative spirit. And we realize that the image of God is in all of us, and this image is the image of the creator. And we're not going to um, heal. We're not going to do something about the despair, the nothingness we feel in the via negativa without getting in touch with our deepest images and sharing them. So you have to stay in via negativa, you say, as long as it's needed to That's get right. this transformation into creativity, you mean? That's right. You have to let pain be pain. You have to let suffering be suffering. You have to let despair be despair and darkness be darkness. You people up here in the north know a lot about darkness. You know how to let darkness be darkness <laughs> and light. You're very welcoming of light after it comes, after nine months of darkness, I'm sure. Right. So there's that wonderful dialectic, this dance of light and dark. And you bring them together and what do you have? You have new birth. It's the yin and the yang. It's the male and female principle. So that's why the third path is very deep and very natural, and it's a path of birthing, and uh, we're all here to give birth. And now we're, what happens when we're in the Via Negativa, you say, that there's also a transformation coming, which is the end of the mystical journey. Yes. Could you describe that? Well, yes, the fourth path of the journey then is compassion, the Via Transformativa, the transformative way of social justice and celebration, of changing society, of changing history, transforming society through our creativity, which comes through our experience of light and of darkness, through awe and of suffering. And um, this is Jesus, isn't it, in the Sermon on the Mount, where he said, be you compassionate, as you create in heaven is compassionate. This is a culmination of the journey. And um, it's, it's so needed today, you see, we, because we don't pay attention to the other three paths in our culture. We don't honor creativity. And we often run from the darkness, we cover it up with addictions, and we don't savor the, the beauty of life and the awe and the wonder. So we're not prepared to be compassionate beings, because you need those other three paths to be equipped to be compassionate. But do you see any signs of this happening, any positive signs? Oh, certainly. Many people today are being awakened, I think, by Gaia. I think the Earth is changing many people. Um, one Swedish person, uh, Rolf Osterberg, is a corporate uh, executive who's written a fine book called The Corporate Renaissance, where in effect he's saying, we have to redefine work entirely. And you see, the fourth path is about work. It's about taking passion for life and compassion into our work worlds, whether that be business or law or media or religion or, or art. Or industrial work? Of course, industrial work, absolutely. And um, I, I believe, of course, that the Industrial Revolution has just about spent itself. And then the next, we have to move out of that definition of work as factory work. There's still some factory work, but very little. We have to realize the next meaning of work is work on the human heart, on the inner house, what E.F. Schumacher calls putting our inner houses in order. And that means there's going to be this tremendous awakening around artwork, because artwork is heart work. Art is meditation. Ritual, for example. Teaching people to play again. Teaching them wisdom and not just knowledge. Teaching them uh, uh, through storytelling. For example, the new creation story through science, through ritual and storytelling. This is going to create whole new jobs for people. And it, it also means reinventing all the work we have. Psychologists, for example, cannot work on the human psyche any longer without working on cosmos 
and on spirituality and mysticism. Because all kinds of people are having mystical dreams and mystical experiences. Even the angels are coming back, and the shamans. And we need deep ecumenism, and by that I mean the world religions have to come together around mystical experience, not around theological position papers, but around praying together in sweat lodges and teepees and with drums and with uh, circle dancing and whatever ways the human race shares in common. And this way the wisdom might come forward from our religions. There's tremendous work to do here for a lot of people. Well, Father Matthew, you have paid a high price for your mission. Since a couple of months you are excluded from the Dominican order and you can't work as a Catholic priest anymore. How about, what do you say about that? Well, I think that the, see the maturing of the mystic is becoming prophetic. And the prophet, as Rabbi Heschel says, interferes. So you go back into the world with your work and you raise questions like Jesus did. And in raising questions, you might make a few enemies here and there, and like Jesus did. So I think this is a story, my story, that applies to everyone today. I think we need prophets in every profession. That's but okay. To, yes, but to be excluded from an order, uh -huh. it's also, it also means loneliness. Is well, it, I was a painful? Dominican for 34 years. It's true, it's like a divorce. But it was a contested divorce. I did not want to leave. I fought very hard to stay in. I think that the uh, Dominican order is, um, what should I say? It's obviously following a policy that the Vatican is engaged in because they've kicked Franciscan Leonardo Buff out in Brazil and Claritians out in Madrid, Spain, and so forth. So it's a, it's a global policy. And I wish the Dominican order had the courage to stand up and say no. Uh, our motto is truth. But I don't think this is the um, proudest moment in the history of the Dominican order. And it was impossible for you to compromise, was it? Yes, because I offered many, many compromises, but the one thing I could not compromise was to end my work in California. And uh, that's what they wanted, that's what the Vatican wanted, to destroy the work. And I could not compromise on that. The work is very important and it's quite unique. And um, it's got to keep going. It's got to keep going. So I'm committed to the work more than ever. So if a and I'm grateful to the Dominicans for what they gave me over the years. So if a person asks you, uh, what is most important, to be true to your own con consciousness or to be true to the church in the world today, what will you answer? Well, there's no question. Jesus taught it. Every saint has taught it, from Luther to Thomas Aquinas. Conscience comes first. Aquinas uh, says that. He's, and he says at one point, he says, there are times in life when we must love truth more than our friends. <laughs>